what is the cosmological argument for the existence of God and what are the leading objections against it? Our guest today, Dr. Stephen Meyer, a Cambridge trained philosopher of science, author of Return of the God Hypothesis, and a friend of Biola is here to address these questions. Steve, good to have you on, my friend. You ready to rock and roll? Yeah, great to be with you, Sean. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's jump right in. Up until the 20th century, you write in your book, most philosophers and scientists believed the universe was eternal, did not have a beginning. Why did that start to change? Um, well, the really the beginning of the change comes with a rather obscure American astronomer named Vesto Slipher. Uh, he was observing the night sky in the 19 teens, 1912, 1913, around then. And he is observing these uh, structures in the night sky called nebula or nebulae in the, in the plural. And they're basically smudges on a photographic plate. And astronomers at the time aren't really sure whether the nebulae uh, represent uh, other galaxies beyond our Milky Way or whether they are just uh, gas clouds clustering around a star within our galaxy. Okay. Either way, what Vesto Slipher recognizes is the light coming from these nebulous structures is um, what the astronomers say red shifted. It's being stretched out mm. so that the wavelengths are longer than they would otherwise be. Uh, and um, folks may be familiar with this phenomenon. It's called the Doppler shift, especially when we think of sound waves. If a train whistle recedes away from us, the pitch of the sound goes lower. Mm. And the same thing happens with light. If you shine light through a prism, the red light corresponds to longer wavelengths and the violet or blue light to shorter wavelengths. And so the shift towards these longer wavelengths suggested that the, these nebular structures were moving away from us, whatever they were. Then in, uh, in the 1920s, uh, uh, Edwin Hubble begins to use these beautiful, great big dome telescopes out in Southern California the Mount Wilson Observatory. Mm -hmm. And he's able to apply some new techniques for measuring distances to these nebular structures and finds out that uh, even one of the putatively closest ones, the Andromeda Nebula, is 900,000 light years away from us. And yet mm. the accepted distance across the Milky Way at that time was 300,000 light years. And so clearly wow. this, this, neb this, this Andromeda Nebula is not just a nebula, it's, it's a galaxy beyond our own. It's, it's beyond our galaxy. Okay. And as, as astronomers then further begin to survey the night sky, including Hubble, using new photographic plates, plate technology, and some of these uh, new techniques for measuring distance that were developed by Henrietta Leavitt, the uh, uh, Harvard astronomer, um, they're able to find that there are galaxies galore in the night sky and almost uniformly, they're exhibiting this red shift, suggesting that, that the universe, first of all, is much bigger than we thought. There's a lot more galaxies, but the galaxies in every direction of the night sky are moving away, mm. suggesting a spherical, roughly spherical expansion of the universe in the, in the forward direction of time. In fact, uh, Hubble was able to determine that there was a linear relationship between the distance to those galaxies and the recessional velocity. The further, mm. the farther out they were, the faster they were receding. Mm. And that observation, because it was consistent across all these different quadrants of the, of the night sky, suggested a spherical expansion of the universe as a whole. And if it's expanding in the forward direction of time, you then begin to Got mentally it. wind that back. If you back extrapolate in your mind's eye, then all that galactic material would have been getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer together in the reverse direction in time, of time until finally it, you reached a limiting, a, a limiting case where everything congealed to a starting point, uh, certainly the start of the expansion of the universe, but arguably the beginning of the, the, the universe itself because past that point, you can't back extrapolate any further. Yep. Uh, you're, you're reaching a limiting case. So that was the first inkling that the universe okay. had a beginning in time, that it was finite rather than um, eternal or infinite 
in time and space. This is super helpful. So in the 20th century, and there, there's so many more factors that you walk through in the book that really tell the story. But basically, there's these scientific discoveries that tell us the universe is much bigger than we imagined, but also it's not static and eternal, seems to have a beginning. Now, what philosophical and or theological implications are at stake, or at least seem to be at stake, if the universe has a beginning? Well... Uh, there's a great physicist from Princeton, uh, Robert Dickey, who was active in the 1960s. And he was actually actively looking for something called the cosmic background radiation, which was a, a specific prediction of the Big Bang theory, the idea of an expansion outward from a beginning, as opposed to a, a later theory known as the steady state theory, which implied that matter was in little tiny bits being continuously uh, created and had been in the process of being continuously created from eternity past, that there was no beginning. And if the universe had a definite beginning point, then you would expect to find the remnant of that initial hot dense point just after the beginning is all that matter begins to expand, matter and energy. Now, uh, that took me off the track of your answering your question, <laughs> which was, uh, what's at stake? Dickey put it really well. Dickey, Dickey was putting on seminars about the the, the, the prediction of the cosmic background radiation and two other astronomers, well, okay. engineers, actually Bell Labs engineers famously found this radiation, even though they weren't cosmologists and they weren't actually looking for it, uh, Penzias and Wilson. In any case, Dickey said that a, an infinitely old universe would relieve us of the necessity of, of explaining or understanding the origin of matter at any finite time in the past. If the universe has always been here, uh, then there's no need to explain where it came from. It, mm. it is the eternal self-existent thing, the ground mm. of all being in philosophical terms. Sometimes worldview scholars talk about uh, the, the most important question is the prime reality question. What is the thing or the entity or the process mm -hmm. from which everything else comes? If the, if the, the, the material universe of ma uh, or the physical universe of matter, space, time and energy is eternal and self-existent. If it's always been here, there's no need to invoke an external creator to explain its origin. And therefore, Dickey said, it would relieve us of the need to posit such an explanation. Wow. Well, that's kind of an interesting phrasing because relieve yeah. us is not exactly a scientific word, <laughs> but it does speak to the emotional and perhaps philosophical, maybe metaphysical import mm. of this question of, of, of an ultimate beginning. If there is an ultimate beginning, then we do need to think about, well, what caused the universe to come into existence? And because of other lines of evidence besides the expanding universe, the evidence of the redshift and the expanding universe, uh, developments in theoretical physics, for example, the, uh, the Hawking-Penrose uh, Ellis singularity theorems, and in particular, something called the bohr guthrie lincoln theorem, there were, there were uh, formal proofs within physics of a space-time singularity that if you go back far enough in time you again get to a limiting case past which you cannot go okay and and that suggests that um we have a a point where of um uh, either zero spatial volume or a, a true temporal temporal singularity where you have to think well if time begins and time and space are connected and matter is in space uh well exactly where are you going to put anything it, it raises some, the, 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 the developments coming out of theoretical physics are suggesting that you have a, you have a definite beginning to the physical universe itself, hmm. in which case it becomes very hard to explain the origin of the universe materialistically, because before the origin of matter, space, time, and energy, as implied by these multiple lines of evidence, which I describe in the book, um, there is no matter to do the causing. And that's, that's, that's the trouble. So typically, then, what the you know the materialists have done is have said, well, there, there, there have been two moves that have been made. Either they opt for something called quantum cosmology, which we can discuss, and that's been where okay. the main action is, or some philosophers will say, well, maybe we can suspend the principle of causality and say it just doesn't mm. apply in the case of the origin of the universe. And those have mm. sort of the, been the two ways of avoiding this difficulty for mater a materialistic philosophy okay. and the need to 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 invoke a cause which transcends those four domains of matter, space, time, and energy, which I think gets you very close to theism. Or the way I'd put it is that 
given the, that requirement of, uh, given what's needed to explain the origin of the universe when we mean the origin of matter, space, time, and energy, right. we need to invoke an entity which has attributes that uh, either a deistic or a theistic God possess and no other theoretical entity. That is to say, therefore, that theism or deism provides a better explanation of the origin of the universe than any materialistic uh, hypothesis or a pantheistic hypothesis which, which equates God and matter as right. uh, coextensive entities. Okay, so we're going to jump into some of these, the most common explanations and challenges and objections to the position that you've laid out. But essentially, it seems to me like the naturalist could take one of three moves, broadly speaking. Number one is to kind of take an agnostic position. We don't know. The data doesn't show it. Our science breaks down, etc. Another would be to try to say that the universe had a beginning, but explain the beginning of the universe without a transcendent source. Or to just reject where you say the science is pointing that the universe itself actually had a beginning. Are those, broadly speaking, the three options at play yeah, for a naturalist? That, that pretty much covers the water. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. All right. So let's jump in to some of the explanations that have been posited to account for some of, some of this data. Roger Penrose has proposed that the universe, the cycle from... It, that the universe cycles from one aeon, so to speak, to the next, which is involving a Big Bang followed by an infinite future expansion that eventually results in the next Big Bang, and then seemingly the next Big Bang. Is this way of a is this an adequate scientific model to account for the Big Bang data, but seemingly without a creator? Well, uh, the Penrose uh, cyclic conformal cosmology model is its formal name, the CCC, okay. uh, is one of uh, a couple of newer models that are essentially modifications of the old oscillating universe idea. Um, another one is a model that's been proposed by Paul Steinhardt. Okay. And, um, and it might be helpful just to review the oscillating universe idea because it has certain it. Uh, f characteristics and also uh, limitations that have been inherited, I think, by the newer uh, versions of those models. The oscillating universe idea was the idea that the universe expands outward as it is, you know, the, it, it accounts for the observations of an expanding universe. Mm -hmm. Then the idea was that there was enough mass in the universe to cause a recollapse. And then the once the all the matter recollapsed, then there would be another expansion and another contraction ad infinitum. And so, yes, the universe is expanding now, but it's only one expansion out of an infinite number of prior and yet future expansions. So we still have an infinite universe and therefore no need to posit a creator or an external mm -hmm. cause of the universe. Um, the, Oscillating universe ran into two big problems. One, it turns out just observationally, there was not enough matter in the universe, even counting the dark matter, mm. to cause a recollapse. But secondly, uh, and this was shown by Alan Guth, the great MIT physicist in the 1980s, uh, that, there, that with each cycle, there would be a loss of energy available to do work or another way to put it would be there would be a buildup of entropy of of highly dispersed non-ordered um, mass energy that was not capable of doing the same amount of work that drove the expansion in the first place okay. so you have this cycling down of energy available to do work or a buildup of entropy with each cycle so that eventually if the universe had been here for an infinitely long time we should have already reached a nullifying equilibrium. It would have been like the ball bouncing, 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 and finally yep. just settling to the ground. So, um, so there's a problem of, of entropy, of, of, of specific energy available to do work at the right time in the right place. Now, the Penrose model is different in that it doesn't see an infinite number of cycles of expansion and contraction, okay. but rather an endless series of expansions and then out of little patches, as I hmm. can as best understand the papers, okay. <laughs> uh, the, it, it, these guys are not real vivid in their visual descriptions of the, what, okay. what they're modeling. But the, what the sense you get is that, is that you have an expansion and then 
there's a out of some out of somewhere in that existing universe there's a patch of that universe and out of that then there's a, a new field that's activated which he calls a phantom field okay and for the phantom field to do work it's got to overcome the entropy that's been built up the disorder that's been built up of the, the first cycle of expansion and so what penrose does is he attributes to the phantom field properties that are associated with no known physical field and he's been mm. critiqued by this by other really prominent people in the, in the physics okay. community um and one of the things he invokes is the idea that there's a there's a, a he just invokes an unexplained new uh concentration of mass at just the right time activate so that the field is activated in just the right way to cause another expansion so there's essentially without getting too much into the weeds there's an essentially an unexplained reduction of entropy okay and creation of new mass energy available to do work at just the right time and in just the right way uh and when you start saying just the right time and just the right way you're talking specificity so that's also mm. a kind of an information input yep. and so yes uh, what i've said is yes the cyclic conformal cosmology can provide an alternative to the god hypothesis but only if you allow the phantom field to possess properties that only agents possess in other words the phantom field has these odd godlike properties to overcome the entropy problem mm. and to act in in, in, a, in essence the phantom field is acting like an agent it's it's acting at just the right in in just the right time in just the right way with an unexplained creation of new mass activated in, in, at just that right time and in the right way so i i think it's it lacks physical plausibility to in the extreme we don't know of any yeah. other physical forces that have those attributes the only things that have that those type of attributes are agents our minds interesting so even if it were true it wouldn't get rid of the need for a creator or a mind or an intelligence behind the universe well i i think there's a kind of a sleight of hand in that the, the okay. field that's been formulated as a theoretical entity is more like an agent than it is like any physical field we know got it. that's that's what i'd say and okay then there's there's also one other problem sean and this is i found a consistent problem in cosmological models going all the way back to the uh to, to einstein's attempt to gerrymander his equations of general relativity to um circumvent its implications of a dynamic expanding universe from the beginning um you, you viewers may recall that einstein uh formulated this thing he called the cosmological constant uh mm -hmm. so his basic background he's got a new theory of gravity general relativity the idea of general relativity is that massive bodies will curve the space or space time around the massive body they'll create a preferred line of trajectory in a cur uh, sort of a curved shape. Um, and it turns out that if that theory of gravity is true, and if gravity is the only force acting in the universe, then eventually all the massive bodies around other massive bodies should kind of circle in and congeal. And then you'd, we'd live in a universe which was a giant black hole, but we don't live in that kind of universe. And Einstein recognizes that, so he says, well, there must be another force at work. So in addition to the inward pull of gravitation, there must be an outward push or an anti-gravity force, which he called the cosmological constant. Okay. Fair enough. But what Einstein then did to preserve the idea of, of, a, of, a, uh, of a, a static universe was he proposed that the cosmological constant would have exactly the same mm. magnitude of a force as the inward pull of gravity so that they would be... the, the, the inward pull of gravity and the outward push of the cosmological constant would be equipoised. They'd be perfectly balanced. Got it. Whereas there was a huge range of other possible values that were much mm. more likely that such that you would, it was much more likely you'd ever either have an expanding or a contracted universe, not a static universe. Got it. So he arbitrarily fine tuned the value himself. Mm. He got around the beginning, but he needed to invoke unexplained fine tuning. Now, turned out the story of Einstein is well known. 
eventually observations were made, the heavens talked back, turns out the <laughs> universe was actually expanding. And he later said that this fudging of his cosmological constant was the greatest blunder of his life. Wow. I misquoted him in the book. I said it was the greatest uh, of his blunder career, of his career, right? No, he, he actually said it was the greatest wow. blunder of his life. Okay? Wow. In any case, point is, consistently in the history of cosmology, when cosmologists have come up with models that have attempted to circumvent the problem of the beginning, okay, they have sometimes been able to do so, but only by invoking huge amounts of prior unexplained fine tuning. So the cost of circumventing the, the problem of the beginning is creating a bigger problem of fine tuning. And it, it happens that that's the case with both the Penrose model and the newer mm. Steinhardt model. Uh, Penrose has okay. to invoke, a he has to invoke a very finely tuned amount of mass energy that will be activated at the right time and in the right way. So there's a huge amount of unexplained fine tuning in his model. It does mean you get around the beginning because you've got an infinite number of cycles, but there's no explanation for where mm. that fine tuning came from. And that's an another way of getting at the other point that I was making is that his physical field really has powers that are in our experience more associated with agency than mm. any physical field we know. We're going to follow up and have a conversation with some of the biggest objections to fine tuning, but it's helpful to see that even these cosmological models intersect with questions of fine tuning. Let's shift to another common naturalistic explanation. I've heard some naturalists posit that maybe there is an eternally existing primeval atom is the term that seems to be sometimes used. So all matter and energy of the universe is compressed into this nearly infinite, hot, dense point that expands into our universe. So this seems to account for the expansion of the universe and that things move back to beginning point. But rather than being a cosmic beginning, there's this eternally existing primeval atom from which all else comes. Is that a plausible cosmological model? Well, it um, it has a number of problems. I address them all in quite a bit of detail in the book. The, the first one is, um, is, is just kind of a philosophical problem or a logical problem. If the primeval atom as a static entity has been existing from eternity past, then there, in order for it to have a change of state and begin an expansion mm. that, that results in the creation of our visible universe, there must be some causal factors, some set of uh, necessary and sufficient conditions that are responsible for that change. But if the primeval atom is to that point, the sum total of all that exists, then any entity capable mm. of acting causally in that manner must transcend the uh, domain in which that primeval atom exists or domain, uh, the, the domain that is coextensive with the primeval atom. Mm. In other words, there must be some kind of transcendent cause that is is acting in that, that is sufficient to explain the change of state from the uh, long quasi eternal existence in a static state to a now dynamic expanding state, and that's never accounted for in in this idea of a primeval mm -hmm. atom. Secondly, I think the best understanding of the theoretical physics is that uh, we don't back extrapolate to a primeval atom, we back extrapolate to a singularity. Mm. Um, uh, and this comes from two different lines of, of uh, evidence in theoretical physics or two different sets of developments. So one is the, 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 um, the, the, the first the Hawking, the, then the Hawking Penrose and the Hawking Penrose Ellis singularity theorems and the, their proofs thereof. And the, the basic idea there that conceptually that's i think fairly easy to understand is that hawking who was working in the 60s in his phd on black hole physics started thinking about well what are black holes or concentrations of matter that are so dense that not even and that the curvature of space is so tight that not even light can get out and he begins then to think about well what the astronomers are telling us or telling or telling the scientists at the time that universe is expanding outward in the forward direction of time. And if that's the case, then he's thinking, well, as you go in the reverse direction of time, as you back extrapolate, the mass energy of the universe gets more and more densely concentrated. But that means then the curvature of space time gets more and more tight. 
And as you go back in time, you reach a point where you again reach a limiting case where the curvature becomes so tight, it can't get any tighter, uh, or the, the mass gets so densely compacted, that the curvature gets so tightly curved that mm -hmm. it can't get any tighter. And that infinitely tight curvature corresponds to zero spatial volume. Now that's not the same thing as a primeval atom. Zero sp mm. in zero spatial vo volume, there's no place to put anything. And oh. that, <laughs> that singularity, if you have infinitely tight curvature, it corresponds to zero spatial volume. That is the limiting case mm. of the thought experiment that, that, that Hawking is doing. Now, I'll be very quick to point out that there is a kind of a, a loophole that has been uh, acknowledged even by Hawking and Penrose and Ellis when they when they first formulated these these theorems and that is that if you go you can back extrapolate almost to the very beginning based on general relativity but not all the way back because uh, when you get to a very very tiny little smidgens of, of space I think it was uh, one one 10 to the minus 33rd of a centimeter and in the amount of time mm that would have elapsed from the beginning to 10 to the minus 43rd of a second after the Big Bang, so-called Planck time. So to say this is a blink of an eye is a huge exaggeration. Okay, so you got <laughs> tiny blink of an okay. eye, tiny little smidgen of space. And in that tiny smidgen of space, um, the mass energy would have presumably all been concentrated, but in that <clears throat> tiny bit of space, we're not exactly sure how gravity would have worked. There may have okay. been, quantum effects, which are always with us, might have come to predominate when things were that small, and we might therefore need a quantum theory of gravity, in which case we can't know for sure that it's legit to back extrapolate all the way to that zero point, okay? Um, now, even so, that's not a picture of a primeval atom. That's maybe sure. something like uh, a plasma state or something. Okay. But here, here's the thing. Out of that loophole developed a whole different approach to cosmology called quantum cosmology. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that we would try to uh, apply the physics of the very, very small, uh, the physics of quantum mechanics to that early state of the universe. So what happened is that the physicists appropriated the mathematical apparatus of quantum mechanics and they adapted the famous Schrodinger equation to describe not the possible positions or momenta of a particle, but all the, the different possible universes that could emerge out of that indeterminate mm -hmm. state. And that became a, a new cosmological model that was meant to circumvent the problem of a beginning, of an absolute okay. beginning. Okay. Mm -hmm. But a number of problems emerged when you upon analysis, and I go through this in the last couple chapters of the book, yeah. chapters 18 and 19. The first was that um, in all of the cosmological modeling, there are two different types of cosmological uh, quantum cosmology. Um, in all the modeling that was done, nobody got rid of the beginning. It was presupposed. Mm -hmm. this, there was still a tr in all the mathematical modeling of how you okay. get from a, that early quantum state of, of, of a quantum gravitational state to our mm -hmm. our universe as, as we find it, all of the models ended up needing to presuppose a singularity, a beginning. Um, secondly, the causal actor in all of this was not a prior material state. It wasn't something prior to the beginning of the universe, like a primeval atom. Rather, it was a mathematical apparatus, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation and something called superspace. And basically it was the math describing all the possible universes that could emerge, that you had, you had a set of equations or an, a mathematical apparatus that described all the possible universes that could emerge out of this quantum, uh, set of possibilities. So you got a, a, and you have this very strange metaphysical implication that you've got matter emerging from math. 
Hmm. And uh, Alexander Vilenkin, one of the great quantum cosmological theorists, said that it's a very strange thing we've got here. He says, well, on what tablet could these physical laws be written on? So what precedes the material universe we know are these quantum physical laws. Mm. Essentially, it's a whole system of mathematics sure. that constitutes our best guess at what quantum gravity would, would look like. But in any case, it's a mathematical reality. It's not a physical reality. And he says, math exists in minds. And so could it be that, so are we really saying then that before there was a material universe, <laughs> Or rather, that a mind predates the, the physical yeah. universe. I mean, that's the mm. implication of the quantum cosmology. And Hawking, who has a slightly different version of quantum cosmology, ends up tumbling to the same worry. And wow. he says, what puts fire in the equations that gives them a universe to describe? Math is causally inert. It doesn't cause things to come right. into existence. Mm. So that's the problem. It has no causal power. There's an even further problem in that that um, to solve, there's this big hairy equation called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. Once solved, it, you, the physicists get what's called a universal wave function, what they, which they represent with the letter psi. The universal wave function then describes all the possible universes that might emerge from that initial singularity, okay? okay? And the, the idea was that if the if the psi function included a universe with attributes like ours as one of the reasonably probable outcomes, then we'd say we'd explain the origin of the universe. That's the quantum cosmological research program. S solve the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. Okay. We get a psi function that includes a universe like ours. Voila, we've explained the origin of the universe. It's a it's a, a logical consequence of this prior mathematical state. Mm -hmm. Problem one, how does math generate matter? Never really answered, okay? That seems to have at least Platonistic, maybe theistic implications because as yeah. Lincoln said, are we saying a mind predates matter? Mm -hmm. But then additionally, it turns out that to solve that wheeler witty equation, the physicist has to choose and arbitrarily choose what are called boundary conditions or boundary constraints on the equation. It turns out that that type of equation has an infinite number of solutions. It's called a functional differential equation for math hmm. geeks. No test on that afterwards. Okay, yeah. But the point is, you can't solve the equation without restricting its degrees of mathematical freedom in multiple ways. And those restrictions hmm. of degrees of mathematical freedom constitute inputs of information, and they're coming from the mind of the mathematical model or the physicist. Wow. So what's actually being modeled by way of explaining the origin of the universe is not even the math generating the universe on its own. It's a mathematical modeler solving wow. a mathematical equation by inputting necessary information into the equation to get an outcome that the modeler wants. It's mm -hmm. an indirect teleological process that involves an intelligent input of information into a mathematical apparatus to get a depiction of a universe that is similar to ours. So I think wow. what's being modeled is actually cosmic intelligent design not hmm. an alternative to the cosmological argument, which is a God hypothesis. I think that the, the quantum cosmologists have inadvertently reaffirmed the, the God hypothesis without meaning to. That's really interesting. Now we've got some objections we're gonna jump into from Sean Carroll. Sorry, that Lawrence. was a very long a very long answer. But anyway, the, yeah. uh, well, actually one more thing on the, okay, on the, go ahead. the primeval atom is that I was talking first about the, um, the, the Hawking Penrose um, Ellis singularity theorems based on general relativity. And it's true, they don't get you all the way back to the beginning, but what they do get you back okay. to is the need for quantum cosmology, which has its own theistic implications. Gotcha. If you take another path on the, on the cosmological decision tree, okay. and you say, well, okay, but there's another proof of the beginning of the universe that's not based on general relativity, it's based on special rel relativity, and geometric considerations only. We don't need to know what our early gravitational, what gravity was like in the earliest smidgens of time after the beginning of the universe. Um, there, and this is the famous bohr guth vilenkin theorem. Mm -hmm. And it does establish a definite beginning to the universe, a temporal beginning to the universe. And I think that also uh, 
eliminates the plausibility of the primeval atom idea for another reason. We, we mm. have a definite beginning where time begins. Time and we know from general relativity that time and energy are, are connected variables. They're intimately yep. connected. Or, sorry, time and space are intimately connected. And so if time begins, space begins, and then you're back to the same old problem. Where do you, you don't, before there's the beginning of time and space, there's no place to put anything. So I think the picture, the best picture we get of the beginning of the universe is of a genuine beginning and not mm. of a primeval, primeval atom. So in many ways, although you go through many more of these in your book than we obviously have time to hear, the story of cosmology in the 20th century is not being able to eliminate the need for an origin of the universe or the need for some kind of intelligence. This keeps cropping up in many, many different ways. Now, let's shift to a, a few suggestions. One uh, from cosmologist Sean Carroll has suggested that the universe may not have a cause, and it might just be. Now, he's obviously not the only one who's made this. If I'm not mistaken, Bertrand Russell said, if you say God just is, maybe just the universe just is. It's our stopping point. Why are you not convinced by the claim that the universe just is and maybe doesn't need a greater explanation? Well, let's address Bertrand Russell first. Um, in the case of the universe, uh, the, to posit the universe as the just is eternally self-existent thing from which all else comes is no longer very plausible because the universe has not just been, it's begun, okay? Mm. It didn't just be forever, it began at a certain point in time, which in our ordinary um, structures of reasoning implies that it had a cause prior mm. to it, or at least mm. um, ontologically prior to it, that it, if something begins to exist, it in all other cases, both in our experience and also in the way our minds have been wired to understand the world in a reasonable way. Um, so I, I'm, par I'm partly a, a Humean on this. Okay. I'm partly a Kantian, if you will. I think there, <laughs> are, there are structures of the mind. Our minds are uh, wired in certain ways in mm -hmm. order to make reasoned thought possible. And one of the one of the structures of the mind is the idea that all events have causes. Mm -hmm. And to suspend that, I think uh, it's possible to say you want to do that theoretically, but no one lives that way in any other um, for in any other particular. There is no other event where we would suddenly say, well, why, maybe it happened for no reason at all. And the people who want to say that the, uh, the, that the universe happened without being caused do not give an explanation as to why it's a legitimate move to make, why it's legitimate to make that move in that case, but not to say that a Bengal tiger could just pop up into mm. onto Main Street for no without being caused, or that um, uh, <clears throat> any other physical event in our experience sure. might have occurred without a physical cause or without a cause of some kind. Mm -hmm. uh, so it ends up, I think, striking nearly everyone who looks at that proposal seriously as a form of special pleading. This is something that's necessary to save naturalism, but there's no compelling reason to suspend the principle of causality for that event and that event alone, uh, especially when we have evidence that the universe as a whole began to exist. It, mm. If the universe had been in existence from eternity past, it would be a plausible candidate to be the eternal self-existent thing from which all else came, the Got ground it. of all being, the ontological basis of reality, the prime reality, if you're talking worldview. But that's not what's been discovered. The universe is a crummy candidate to be that thing because it had a beginning. And therefore, uh, based on the ordinary structures of our mind, the way we reason, and have learned to reason in order to know the world as accurately as we can, um, we should assume that that event, like all other events, had a cause. Now, to this question that the universe just is, you said you would begin with Bertrand Russell. 
Is there anything you would add to the claim that uh, that cosmologist Sean Carroll makes, or does the same principle well, essentially I, I apply? Well, I was already segueing to that in my previous answer. The point is okay. that I don't think Sean Carroll or anyone else who wants to invoke a causeless beginning to the universe has any has an adequate justification for suspending the principle of causation in that in the case of that okay. one event as opposed to all others. In other words, if you are willing to suspend the principle of causation and say, yes, our minds are wired a la Kant to, th to view all events as having cause, but that's not really, the, but our minds are inaccurate. Are the, those mental structures, are the, the, the Kantian synthetic a priori are inaccurate, okay. um, then in a sense, all bets are off. We can't make any sense of the world around us. Um, and uh, unless there's some, we have some reason to say, well, this and only this event is one where we can suspend that principle of reasoning. Got it. Um, and I don't think, I don't think an, anything like an adequate justification for that has been offered. Instead, I, I once heard Bill Craig say, well, if we're going to say that um, the universe could come into existence as an uncaused, without a cause, then let those who say defenders of theism are irrational be forever silenced. Mm. Because we may as well say that a, a locomotive or a hot air balloon or a Bengal tiger or anything else could come into existence mm. uh, without a cause, in which case we cannot make sense of the world. There is no basis for reasoning about it. The principle of causation is one of the foundational principles of reasoning. Yes, it may be hardwired into the brain, but as a theist, I have reason to trust in the hardwiring of my brain. I think there was a benevolent creator that undergirds uh, epistemological mm. realism. Now, you commented earlier that math or mathematical laws are not a good candidate for the origin of the universe. Uh, and one reason being they're causally a feat. You need something to breathe fire into these kinds of mathematical laws. Others have suggested, well, maybe it's the laws of physics that can explain the origin of the universe. Is this a better candidate since laws of physics are different than mathematical laws? Um, well, the laws of physics are, what are uh, what, what's being invoked in the case of the quantum cosmological models are laws of quantum mechanics. At the law, it's a law of quantum mechanical gravity, as best as it's been sketched out. Uh, and there is no difference. Uh, uh, the fundamental laws of physics are mathematical in character. In their description, they don't have causal efficacy. This is a big, mis a big mistake in the, in the philosophy of physics. Or it's a misconception that many physics, physics students end up carrying around because of the way their professors end up talking about the physical laws as if they were things. Physical laws are we we write down physical laws as mathematical expressions maxwell's equations or newton's gravitational force equation or whatever it is and those e equations allow us to describe the motions of material or ener of matter and energy in precise ways so we they, they pr allow us to describe what the mm. natural world does but they do not cause things to happen in the natural world. There are regularities that we can observe that does raise the question, why do those regularities occur? But whatever the answer is, the answer, the, the answer to that question is not our mathematical descriptions. That, that'd be like confusing the longitude and latitude lines on the map for what caused the Himalayan mountains to rise. Hmm. Uh, we can use those longitude and latitude lines to identify where the Himalayas are on the map, but that doesn't cause whatever is going on on the globe at that place. I mean, there's a difference between the map, which is a description, and the globe, which is being described. And we get those things confused oftentimes. We rarify the math as the, the philosophical fallacy that that's, uh, philosophers of science refer to. Um, and this goes back to the debate about gravitation with with Einstein and, and Leibniz, uh, or sorry, with, with, with Newton and Leibniz. Newton famously said, hypothesis non fingo. I don't feign to know the cause of gravity, but I can describe it mathematically okay. with precision. And uh, I think there is a very good 
I think the best account of what a law of nature is, is actually provided by theism, but that's another debate, okay? The one thing that laws aren't is the, the, the fundamental laws are, fit, are, are descriptions rendered in mathematics, usually differential equations. And they so don't cause things to happen, they describe things that are happening on an ongoing basis, usually. Gotcha. That, that, that makes sense. Now, as soon as we have these conversations about the origin of the universe, quantum mechanics, quantum physics comes up. The claim is that we see uncaused things happening on the quantum level all the time. So why couldn't we assume that that would apply to the universe as a whole and maybe be the exception that you were referring to earlier? Um, well, of course, that's contentious within in physics um, as to whether or not uh, quantum mechanical uh, phenomena are uncaused or whether they are occurring on a scale that escapes our ability to describe their causes. Um, I would say that even if you opt for a sort of Copenhagen interpretation that denies causality, Okay. You run into other theistic implications when you apply that to the origin of the universe. So let's say that our we're going to give a quantum mechanical description of the origin of the universe, and we're going to have a quantum mechanical wave function describing all the different possible universes that could emerge. And that wave function represented with the letter psi, the Greek letter psi, describes a whole bunch of possible universes that are consistent with, say, quantum theory of gravity or a solution to the, they represent a you know a, a possible solution the psi function represents a solution to our possible solution to the wheeler dewitt equation so now we've got a mathematical description of a range of possible universes and now the claim is well um uh they're gonna the universes are gonna pop into existence the same way um a particular particle with a, in a particular position or with a particular momentum pops into existence in a quantum mechanical system. Um, well, if you go with the Copenhagen interpretation, what causes the wave function to collapse okay. where all those possibilities become actualized? It's an observer. Now, in the, the those who want to claim that there's no physical cause for the wave function collapsing in the quantum mechanical context will say what well, was the observation if anything that caused the, the the discrete particle with a position and momentum to arise well if you apply that in the cosmological case then you need a then you need a cosmic observer to collapse the quantum oh. mechanical wave function interesting and so maybe hmm. you don't have physical determinism but you have an observation you, you have the need for an observation hmm. now there are a range of possible quantum mechanical interpretations so this is a much okay. bigger subject sure but my point is that facile appeals to a causality to say we don't need causality just because we're in a quantum realm doesn't necessarily eliminate the theistic implications of that quantum realm either in the hmm in the ordinary quantum mechanics or in the quantum co cosmological. If you take us, for example, if you take a straight up, you know, canonical Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics and you apply it in the quantum cosmological domain to get from the psi function describing multiple possible universes to a discrete universe like ours, you would need a cosmic observer, in which mm. case you've implicitly affirmed the existence of a godlike mind prior to the origin of the universe, even if you've gotten rid of physical determinism mm -hmm. or some sort of determinism. Um, so, um, and there are other, obviously there's a range of other, there's a sure. big debate about different ways to interpret quantum mechanics, but I mean, there's also a deterministic way to interpret quantum mechanics, sure. but um, I'm going to remain agnostic about those different interpretations and say that that the um, that the different ways of formulating 
cosmological origins theories invariably are leading towards theistic implications. Mm. So you would say when it comes to quantum mechanics right now that the physics world and beyond is, is there's division as to whether it's really deterministic or whether it's indeterministic, and we we really can't tell between which of those it actually yeah, is. Yeah, one of the indeterministic and, models involves observer dependent reality, and you know, okay. um, I mean that's that was the main way of getting rid of standard determinism was to say that there's an mm -hmm. observer determinant reality but if you opt for observer determinant reality and you want to apply that to the origin of all reality the beginning of the universe you end up with a cosmic observer that doesn't really help you if you're a materialist <laughs> that's a really really interesting way to look at it my approach by the way my approach to, the, to cosmological argument generally there are very good ways of cashing out the cosmological argument. There's a standard Kalam argument that mm -hmm. Craig and others mm -hmm. have developed, your colleague J.P. Moreland. I think those are perfectly fine arguments. My preferred approach is, and they're usually rendered in deductive form, in a mm -hmm. deductive form. Whatever begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe must have a cause. Causes are separate from effects, therefore, you know, et cetera. Yep. And then you unpack the characteristics of the cause based on mm -hmm. the nature of the effect and so forth. I think those are fine arguments. Um, I've developed the cosmological argument as an inference to the best metaphysical explanation. Okay. And one thing that allows, as, as an argument structure or strategy that allows you to do, is um, develop a sort of robust approach to the argument. If someone says, well, I don't accept your factual predicate. I don't accept that there was an actual actual beginning. We can't know that for sure. We can only back extrapolate as far back as Planck time. We can't go back any further for sure. I say, well, what about the board guth felinkin theorem? Well, other than that, let's set that. But on the basis of general relativity, we can't. Okay, all right. But well, okay. let's take let's take that as a given. Then let's say, if we go with a quantum cosmological model instead what are the implications of that? And if quantum cosmology, when examined carefully, has its own tacit theistic implications, then what you have is a kind of um, robustness in the argument. It doesn't matter which factual predicate you affirm of the, of the credible possibilities, if they all end up leading to the same conclusion. And that's actually where I think you, we are in the, with the cosmological argument. Hmm. If you don't want to say it's an absolute singularity and you want to say, I'm going quantum cosmology, well, then you've got to account for unexplained infusions of information to restrict degrees of mathematical freedom. And you've got to explain how math alone can produce matter. And you ha you've got other problems. If you want to say, well, I want to say indeterminate, I want to interpret quantum mechanics in an indeterminate observer caused reality way, well, then you've got a different theistic implication because you've got the need for a cosmic observer to collapse your universal wave function, et cetera. So that, that's okay. the kind of approach that I think has a lot of, a lot of uh, potency and persuasive power and uh, showing, in a sense, to use a different metaphor, all roads lead to Rome. You know, all roads are leading okay. to the same conclusion, irrespective of whether you quibble about this or that um, fine point. Now, one of the strengths of the CLAM is it's just so simple. Two premises and a conclusion. Whatever begins to exist has cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Is there an equally or closely similar kind of simple way of framing the cosmological argument uh, in your approach that you prefer, or is it just going to require more unpacking? Well, it's not done with uh, syllogistically that way. It's okay. uh, more of a scientific or philosophical approach the, using the method of multiple competing hypotheses. Got it. And you put on the table the, the key facts that have to be explained, and then you then you uh, posit the different, in this case, metaphysical hypotheses. They'd be different systems of thought, theism, deism, materialism, pantheism, panentheism, etc. And you put them all out there, and then you say, well, uh, based on the types of entities that each metaphysical system is positing and the attributes associated with them, which of those possible metaphysical hypotheses could provide a, an adequate causal explanation? And 
and then I then I evaluate. You know, and I think theism is the best. Deism is mm -hmm. pretty close for the cosmological argument only. There's other kinds of evidences that I think d can help distinguish between theism and deism as as to whether they're better explanations. I think pantheism and materialism fail. Panentheism is kind of a little bit of a hybrid thing to the extent that it's not pantheism, it's really theism. And it's to the extent that it's theism that it can provide yeah. a adequate explanation to the extent that it, it affirms something, a transcendent causal entity separate mm -hmm. from the universe, then it does provide an adequate explanation. It's always a little unclear as to the extent to which panentheists are really affirming anything transcendent or not, but to the extent they are, then they may have something that can function as an adequate causal entity to explain the origin of the universe itself. I'm glad to hear you're not super clear on panentheism because I'm actually feel that way myself and try to grasp it. I have it, a so. couple of long footnotes about it because it is, <laughs> it depends on, are you talking about Horace Shorn or, you know, it's, it's got right, different right. variants. Yeah. So I got a few last more popular level questions for you. Uh, one is I get asked this can a I, lot. Can I say one thing uh, sure. in favor of both, both these approaches? Uh, Go ahead. The deductive approach is clear. It's simple. And it has strong probabilistic force because each of the mm. premises are are uh, defensible, um, but not with absolute certainty because, well, that's just the way it goes. Uh, they, if you have an inductive premise or an abductive premise like the universe had a beginning, well, we've got multiple lines of evidence pointing to that, but okay. it is an empirically derived premise. Now, Bill and I did a I did a podcast with him about this with Frank Turek recently. He wants to say that that you can establish that second premise that the universe had a beginning purely by physical or by, by logical and metaphysical arguments uh, 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 against um, uh, uh, challenging the, the plausibility of actual infinites. And I think I'm probably sympathetic to that, but my brain hurts too much when I try to think <laughs> about that actual <laughs> infinite problem. So he's probably right. Okay. But I, it's just not the way I've, Typically, Fair I enough. came out of a science and philosophy of science background and less analytical philosophy, but I, I, it's probably a good, good approach. Uh, I think I got to know him and know JP on the phone when I was a young professor, when mm. I was teaching some of those things, and I had to call them both up and get them to explain That's it cool. to me again. You know. Anyway, um, the inference to the best explanation approach has... Uh, it's not quite as simple to explain because you have to look at all the different hypotheses, but you end up having to do that anyway because your alternative hypotheses and an inference to the best explanation gotcha. approach end up being your objections yep. or, or related to the objections in your deductive approach. So the two things end up being kind of interconvertible logically. And I just like laying out, well, what are the different options, explanatory okay. options, and weighing the pros and cons. And the as far as the, a practical matter, I think that approach has the virtue of being the way we actually reason in real life. You know, whether right. we're detectives or, you know, looking at stuff around the house, trying to figure out, you know, if my wife <laughs> figures out that I was home because there was a bunch of muddy footprints and sticky fingerprints and, you know, reasoning from effects mm. back to causes is something we do quite commonly in science, in in detective work, in ordinary life. And I think the great metaphysical detective story uh, can also be adjudicated using that same abductive reasoning from effects back to causes, weighing competing mm. causal explanations, evaluating which one is best, and then affirming the one that is most causally adequate as our preferred hypothesis, given what we know at this point. So it doesn't make the same claim to degrees of certainty, but I think it is rooted in a practical form of reasoning that a lot of people find very persuasive. We are very consistent in applying that to the origin of life and DNA, applying that to fine tuning. I think if I'm not mistaken, even different archeological accounts, I've seen you apply a similar kind of reasoning there as well. So that makes sense. A few popular objections for you since sure. we're on cosmology, yes, sir. Sorry, I want to hear. Giving such uh, long answers here. Uh, yeah, so if God caused the universe, what caused God? Oh, I love that uh, objection. Um, I would start to answer that in the following way. Every metaphysical system or every worldview has to affirm something as the prime reality or the ground of all being or the thing from which everything else came. 
in every every system of thought, mm -hmm. there is what worldview scholars call a, a prime reality or an answer to the prime reality question, what more formally trained analytical philosophers call the question of ontology. Um, and if the, the if uh, the, you know the the materialists think they have a kind of a gotcha question or question or op, you know, who who caused God or who designed the designer, um, but you can turn that around just as easily and say, um, you know, if the origin of life is produced by the first simple replicator, wh what was the replicator that produced the replicator? I mean, you can always mm. do the what be, what came before that trick, okay? The question, the, the real issue is, um, what is a good candidate? What's the best candidate to be that eternal self-existent thing that is affirmed in every system of thought? Is matter or our matter and energy or our matter, mm. energy, space, and time the best candidate to be the thing from which everything else came? Or is it a transcendent creative intelligence? God. Mm. And I think in light of the cosmology, the developments in astrophysics, astronomy, and theoretical physics over the last 100, 100 years, all of which are pointing to a beginning to the physical universe of matter, space, time, and energy, that matter, space, time, and energy, or the material world, is a poor candidate to be the thing from which everything else came. Because mm -hmm. again, it has not been from eternity past. It began a finite time ago, it, suggesting the need for something else external to itself as the ground of all being. And insofar as theism posits an agent or entity separate from the physical world that is eternal and self-existent, that has the quality of timelessness, the great I am that I am in Exodus, um, hmm. I think it provides a better explanation of the origin of the universe and the ground of all being than does materialism. Hmm. All right, Steve. And this... Actually, this is an, an oh. illustration of where the IBE framework or way of reasoning provides some utility in addressing questions like this. If we just have to answer the question, well, who, who made God? Well, that's a hard question to answer. But it's okay. also a hard question to answer. Um, if matter existed from eternity, what existed before that? I mean, you can ask, ask the exact same question. Mm. You know, but, but if both theism and classical materialism affirm an eternal self-existent something, you can ask of both somethings what came before that. Sure. But the real question, so yes, you could do that, and that may be unanswerable, but insofar as in all systems of thought, we presuppose something as the ground of all being, as the thing from which everything else comes, then we now have a way of asking which posited something provides a better explanation of the facts we see around us in the world. And I think theism does that. Gotcha. The Bible that makes... is also, interestingly, okay. I'm, I'm not just a theist, a biblical Christian. Yeah. The Bible is interesting in what it affirms. It affirms that, that Yahweh, hmm. and apologies to Jewish friends, but the name that God uses in the Old Testament of himself is actually an affirmation of his eternal, timeless being. I, I am that I am. So that's an interesting, the way God presents himself to mankind is as that eternal self-existent thing that mm. neither had a beginning nor will have an end, and which mm. is the ground of all being. Now, we're also told in the Bible that understanding that is very hard. It, it says in Ecclesiastes that God has written eternity on their hearts, but they can compre comprehend it not. That's why mm. I have trouble with Bill's ac arguments against actual infinites. <laughs> sure, <know>? sure. <laughs> but... but uh, in any case, there's a kind of realism, I think, a philosophical realism about the Bible in that the things that it affirms as primary or foundational, uh, the, the character of God or the limits of human reasoning are really true to our experience, or tr in one case, true to our experience in, this, in the sense of um, that it does, in the description of our li intellectual limitations, but also philosophically intriguing in that the way God is described in the Bible 
is in terms of attributes that would be necessary to account for existence. Mm. An eternal self-existent entity that could have brought the physical universe into existence a finite time ago. It has the necessary attribute of transcendence or separateness from the physical universe that would allow it to function as a cause of the universe as a whole. Hmm. All right, Steve, isn't this an example of the God of the gaps where we may be lacking a scientific explanation and you're just inserting God in something? If we did that in the past in science, think of all the things we would fail to understand. So is this a God of the gaps and a science stopper or not? Uh, no. And many people will, uh, I think, be tempted after my last answer to stand up and say, yes, obviously it is. Stop the God of the gapsing. But let me let me let me uh, take that on, too. Um, God of the gaps is another way of expressing the uh, claim that someone has made an informal um, ar an argument from ignorance, which is an inf a fallacy in informal logic. And arguments from ignorance have the same the, the following logical form. Cause A is not sufficient to produce effect X. Okay. Well, therefore cause B did it. Mm. It, that's fallacious because we didn't offer any independent reasons for thinking that cause B could produce effect X. A God of the gaps argument is just an inform is an informal the informal fallacy of an argument from ignorance where the cause invoked is God rather than A or B or fire or water or whatever the other physical cause might be. So, so I say, um, uh, well, let's start actually with intelligent design. I ma made the argument that um, neither chance nor physical chemical necessity nor the combination of the two can produce the information necessary to produce the first mm -hmm. living cell. But I, I, but I argue we do know of a cause which is known to have the power to produce that effect, specified information. And that causes intelligence. So among those four types of causes, Got it. chance, necessity, the combination of the two, and intelligence, intelligence is the only known cause with the requisite powers to produce the effect in question. So when I infer to intelligent design as a cause of the information necessary to produce the first living cell, I'm not arguing from ignorance. Yep. I'm not arguing from a gap in our knowledge. I'm actually arguing or inferring based on our knowledge of the cause and effect structure of the world. I've seen agents produce that type of effect in other situations, and therefore I have grounds for positing intelligence as a causal explanation in relation to this other relevantly similar fact or in a case of specified complexity or specified mm. information, identical kind of fact. So that's not an argument from ignorance. And it's an argument from knowledge, the knowledge, our knowledge of cause and effect and the knowledge of the effect that has to be explained. Now people say, OK, but that's just for intelligent design. But what if you're saying that the designer is God, as you do in your new book? Mm. Well, in the new book, I also point out that in science, we often make judgments about causal adequacy based not only on direct observation of one type of cause producing a, a given type of effect, but we will also make judgments of causal adequacy based on seeing what relevantly similar entities are capable of producing and or on the basis of a theoretical analysis of the attributes of a postulated entity. The guys that were looking for the evidence of the Higgs boson or of mm -hmm. the first quarks had never they had no they had no prior experience of quarks producing certain types of effects or Higgs the Higgs particle producing a certain type of but they had theoretical understanding of the attributes of those entities 
and based on relevantly similar experience with other similar entities, we're able to generate empirical expectations or predictions of what they should see those entities producing under given circumstances. And that same si sort of uh, move, uh, move, which is a move of, of extrapolation, can be used to generate expectations about what you would ought, ought to see, mm. what you ought to see if God were if there were a God acting to create the universe as opposed to a an undirected material process being the only thing in play. Richard Dawkins himself has acknowledged the testability of such metaphysical hypotheses. He says that the universe has exactly the properties we should expect if at mm. bottom there is no purpose, no design, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. The blind, pitiless, pitiless indifference is his shorthand for materialism undirected material processes. So he's saying my materialistic metaphysical hypothesis has been confirmed by the things I, the properties mm. I see in the universe. And I think that's a lovely framing for a discussion <laughs> because I want to say, is that true? Materialist, did you expect the universe to have a beginning? Did you expect it to be exquisitely finely tuned from the beginning? Did you expect the digital information present in cells or the complex digital information storage transmission and processing system inside cells. Two summers ago, Dawkins himself admitted to being knocked sideways with wonder at the complexity of the digital processing system wow. or information processing system inside the cell when he saw it animated by an Australian group who did an animation mm. of, the, of DNA replication. So I would say that metaphysical hypotheses are testable in the same way scientific ones are by comparing the expectations they generate with the observations we make of the world and the observable, the expectations for observations that they generate with the actual observations we make. Mm -hmm. And I think theism has passed those tests in ways that materialism as a worldview has not. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's one point. The other is that we have a relevantly similar um, experience with other agents, namely human agents, that'll, that allow us to know something about the kind of things that agents do that undirected material processes don't. And that allows us to generate expectations of the kinds of things we should see agents producing, or conversely, that the type of causal powers that we might reasonably ascribe to God as a person, entity, or even as a theoretical entity. If we mm. want to posit God, the God hypothesis, there are certain sorts of things we attributes and causal powers we could reasonably ascribe to such an entity, and that would generate testable or ob observable consequences that either may or may not come true. So I don't think it's a God of the gaps. I think, again, mm. our knowledge of what sort of things God might do are grounded in many other in many sources of information. One of those might be scripture, but uh, also in our knowledge of relevantly similar entities, namely human agents and what we do. Hmm. That's great. Super helpful. Final question for you is I've heard some people say, well, the cosmological argument doesn't get us all the way to the Christian God anyways. At best, it's compatible with Judaism and Islam, and you said it earlier, maybe even some kind of deistic god. So what's the value, and uh, how significant can it be? Um, I'm, I'm interested in the word anyways. Um, it, it sort of says, well, then does it really matter? Who cares, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, it doesn't do all those things. I've been quick to acknowledge that, but it, I think provide strong grounds for extricating oneself from a materialistic or strictly pantheistic worldview, or um, I think it provides a reason to believe in God without providing a proof of a particular uh, theistic or deistic conception of the creator. Um, and I think it's the first step possibly in a, uh, a metaphysical investigation that might then lead to mm -hmm. questions about, well, what is, does a deistic God or a theistic God provide a better overall explanation for the evidence that we see in the natural world? That's a question I address in 
my most recent book, uh, Return of the God Hypothesis. I think the biological evidence um, is something that is better explained by a theistic notion of a creator who is active in the creation after the beginning than a deistic notion of the creator who or which by definition limits its activity to the beginning of the universe. Um, so I think as you, what I do in the Return of the God Hypothesis is look at an ensemble of key evidences about biological, physical, and cosmological origins mm -hmm. and argue that of the competing metaphysical hypotheses on offer, things like theism, deism, pantheism, panentheism, uh, panspermia, the space alien designer hypothesis, uh, that of those candidates, theism provides the best overall explanation and by best, I mean the best causally adequate explanation. Mm. And this was a shorter answer to your earlier question about God of the gaps. And because I provide uh, a reasons for, for assigning certain causal powers to God as an entity who might act, in other words, in other words because there are reasons for thinking that God might possess certain causal powers, then it becomes possible to generate empirical expectations and also invoke God as an explanation that is motivated by our knowledge or understanding or theoretical thinking about cause and effect in a way that means that the God hypothesis is not an argument from ignorance. Hmm. We're providing a positive reason for affirming it as an explanation, not just saying, well, X can't do it, therefore God must have. I love your recent book. I've told you this. Uh, I want to encourage viewers. I've read it a couple times, Return of the God Hypothesis. And just like you said, some of Craig's sections makes your head hurt. I'm not going to lie, Steve. There's a couple points I stopped. I thought, <laughs> all right, this is making my head hurt. This is stretching my scientific understanding, which is okay and which is good. But you write deep stuff, very, very readable for people who want to probe into this without the necessary scientific background. I've always appreciated that about you. And I've also said, I'll tell you this here, you're obviously one of the leading thinkers of our day, trained at Cambridge, just really advanced in the Christian case, but I've always admired, every time I've seen you engage people just graciously and respectfully uh, and thoughtfully is the kind of model we want to have in our students here at Biola. So for those of you watching, uh, make sure you pick up a copy of Return of the God Hypothesis, whether you are Christian or skeptic or a pantheist or even a panentheist. Pick up a copy of this. Check it out. I think you will enjoy it. Make sure you hit subscribe. Steve and I are going to have a follow-up conversation on the fine-tuning argument. Clarify what that is. Look at some of the biggest objections to the fine-tuning argument, and maybe what that shows or doesn't show about the character or nature of God. And make sure, if you've thought about studying apologetics, I would love to have you. Steve comes out and teaches every couple of years a full three-day course on this stuff in depth. We'd love to partner with you. Steve, really quickly, how can people best follow you and your work? Well, we have a real nice website that our uh, colleagues here at, uh, have constructed uh, just return of the God hypothesis.com. It's got op-eds, it's got interviews, it has debates, it has um, mm. endorsements, it has critique, it has responses to critique. Um, if you're interested in investigating the God question, um, it's a great repository of, of content. And I'm uh, having some people uh, corner me at events and say, hey, I saw I saw some of this. I'm into it. Thanks for putting it up. So it cool. seems to be connecting with some people. So thanks. Love it. Return of the God hypothesis.com. Steve, looking forward to our next conversation. Thank you very much so, Sean. Thanks a lot.